Okay, hi everyone, uh, I'm Vanessa. I'm still from Castro and University of Sydney, as yesterday. Um, today I'm going to talk about Archiver, which is something that was developed during my PhD, but it's continuing to run now. Um, so it's a little bit different from the things that other people have talked about because rather than providing like a package or um, like software development for a specific telescope or something or even education, this is using Python to provide a service. So Python does all the work for us but the end result is a web page so it's a little bit different um, in terms of what it is developed for. Um, my aims through the talk are basically to show you guys how Archiver works uh, demonstrate how we've kind of interacted with the community to make Archiver better, hopefully, um, and also ways that you can also contribute your Python skills that aren't necessarily what you might think of in general. <coughs> uh, it's currently being run by me and Aiden. This is the only photo I could find of both of us. This was in 2010 in Hobart. So there's, anyway, that's the background of that photo. Uh, and you can reach us at either of those two Twitter handles. Aiden's currently making ASCAT work in Western Australia. So pretty cool, so I don't see him too much in it at the moment. Uh, to look at the inner workings of Archiver, um, what we do, and the red is the libraries that we use, so if you're interested in any of those, you can come talk to me. Some of them are like really basic, like OS. But um, we use URL lib to get the information from Archive. Uh, we download from that, we get download each paper's table. We look inside the table for the images. Um, I think other than that, we also have PNG. So those are basically the image formats that we look for. Uh, and then we've we're pretty proud that we use Fourier transforms. Uh, so we Fourier transform each image to pick a selection of figures that represents the paper. Um, and I'll talk more about that. We use this library WordPress XML RPC to post to WordPress from Python. Uh, and then finally, which is pretty new, we add an email notification to make sure that it's run okay. And if you think that getting an email from Archiver is not cool, that's what it looks like. So it's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was so happy when that worked. <laughs> uh, anyway, so why is the literature important? I think everyone in this room probably already knows. Um, but basically, it's to keep up with what other people are doing, specifically if it's relevant to you. Uh, and especially in an era where our publications, as well as our knowledge of other publications, is really important uh, in your role as an astronomer or an astrophysicist. And so that's why the literature is important. Um, how has it changed? So this plot from Rob Simpson, which some of you might have seen before, uh, shows how much the literature publications have changed since 1960. I think it's pretty scary, especially the Munrise trend, uh, the blue one, which is just going like pfft. So basically, as well as having more astronomers, people are also publishing more. Uh, and so there's a lot more literature just to try and keep on top of every day. We're looking at, um, I mean, looking at the number of papers that we get every day in Archiver, it's anywhere between 50 and 100. Like 40 is a low day. So there's a lot of new astronomy papers coming out. And in fact, I think all of physics, so Astro PH is its own thing, all of physics is less than astronomy. <laughs> so astronomy itself is also publishing more than other fields, like other sciences. I don't know how many people also know about this, but Archive itself has changed its identifier. So they used to use four numbers after the year and the month to signify how many pa what number that paper was the month. But now they're expecting over 10,000 papers each month, so they've added an extra number. Uh, so lots of papers. So how does Archiver help? Like, what does it do differently to Archive? Um, well, we we found that looking at archive was a bit painful because it's very repetitive, it's a lot of text, it's, not, like, it's hard to kind of, I guess, see where one paper ends and the other starts. So we reformat that and we present the metadata as well as, and I think the key thing that Archiver does is the figures. So adding figures from a paper helps you to easily judge what that paper's about in a quicker way. Um, so this is a kind of standard thing that you'll see if you go to the Archiver website, which you can do at the top. Um, so what you've got is the title, uh, in brackets is the category in, in Astro PH that it's in. So this one's an instrumentation paper. Um, you also have the link straight to the archive page. Then three figures, um, so it looks like more, but these are three individual figures from that paper. So it, it's picked those and displayed them. You have the abstracts plus another link to archive. Um, the authors, which are not random, that <laughs> um, the random is talking about this here. So the, the ordering of the papers is randomized from archive, and that's to kind of get around that whole submission bias issue, because we thought that like people writing scripts to post at eight was a bit weird. Um, and then we also include the, I don't know, has anyone in this room done? Anyway, uh, <laughs> comments, which, um, so people wanted to know what kind of papers were being published, and the easiest way for us to do that, because we didn't really, like papers can be from anywhere, they can be from proceedings, uh, was to just include the comments straight from archive, which helps in most cases with where it's being published. 
We have handy tips now, so that hasn't changed for a while. This is basically authors can select their own figures. So if they don't want the archive algorithm to go do it, uh, archiver, then they can put in a, a comment in their LaTeX which figures they want to appear. Not too many people have used that, so please use that more. Uh, updates, uh, categories, so if you only want to look at galaxy astrophysics, then you can select that. And you can also search. So if you've published a paper in the last year, then your last name will probably be up there, hopefully. Um, Archiver has had a little downtime sometimes. <laughs> um, so this is just showing what the different papers look like. So this is a hydrodynamics paper, so how it changes from archive to archiver. Uh, a binary black hole paper and a, an imaging, like a new imaging technique paper. So it really makes it a lot easier to gauge what the paper's about, like almost instantly, in most cases. Uh, if, you, if, you know, pictures aren't great, um, then you can also check out Cloudy Science, which is the kind of spin-off from Archiver that no one really knows about yet. Uh, what this does is, is built very much the same as Archiver and it runs at the same time, but uh, it takes the PDF and takes all the words and makes word clouds. So if you like words, you can do that instead. Um, so talking about the images and how we pick them, because I think that's one of the interesting kind of techniques. We originally started off thinking if machine learning would be relevant, but then we decided it was a little bit too subjective and difficult to implement in practice. And we, th we wanted something that would, you'd come at the paper and you'd just be completely objective with picking figures. And at CSIRO and in just in radio astronomy in general, we all love Fourier transforms, so any excuse to use a Fourier transform is exciting. Uh, and so that's what we came to. And Aiden like, literally went away one night and came up with a number. So we decided that we, because the Fourier transform, the two-dimensional, wait, I can't remember what the next slide is. Okay, you can look at that. <laughs> um, the two-dimensional Fourier transform, which is shown on the bottom, uh, gives you the information about the spatial frequencies in the image. So you know, we knew right away looking at it that things with lines in them were going to have a lot of high frequency structure. Uh, things that had more smoothly varying have less of that, but pretty much all figures in an astronomy paper have axes, so you always get some high frequency structure. Uh, but what Aiden came up with was a number to represent how that distribution existed. Uh, and so that score at the top is what we use to select the images in Archiver. Uh, basically, we take the one with the lowest score, the one with the highest score, and the median, and the idea there is that you get a representation of figures in the paper by doing that. Uh, initially, we, uh, we announced Archiver like in late 2013, um, and we did it through, firstly through Twitter, so you can see the little Twitter bump there, and then we put it on the Facebook astronomers group. Um, the reason I'm showing this is just because it highlights, I guess, how useful that group can be to spread information about tools and things that exist uh, in a kind of like a large way, so a lot of people saw it, um, and in this case, Facebook was more effective than Twitter. This is our current usage. The light blue is views, the dark blue is visitors. So we're pretty happy that it's fairly consistent and that most astronomers stop doing work on the weekends, but not all. Um, <laughs> and I don't know why April 1st, I mean, maybe people expected us to do something funny, but we failed. So April 1st had a big surge in views, but nothing exciting happened there next year. Uh, this is our usage distribution across the world, um, color coded by, I guess, the density of views. This is since it started. And I think most of them are real, like I don't know, so maybe some in, the, in Africa are not, but most of the hits are genuine, so we're actually reaching real astronomers in real countries. Uh, this is the distribution of uh, this is all the countries that are above a thousand views, so if your country is not up there, you're not looking at Archiver enough. Uh, and everything in total, we've got about 124,000 views, so it's not huge, but mainly we're just happy that we have like a kind of consistent user base coming back and using it, and also emailing us if things go wrong or to improve it as well, so that's cool. We also have it on Twitter, so each post is automatically sent to Twitter as well because some people prefer to look at it there, um, and so there's 20,000 tweets, like archivers getting up there, <laughs> which is pretty cool, uh, we about 200 followers, and if anyone has an idea for a new archiver logo, let me know, because that was very early on and starting to annoy me. These are our views over time. Uh, mostly interesting because oh, I have this stick. I brought my stick and I forgot to use it. Um, you can see the initial Facebook spike. You can see Christmas and another Christmas. Um, and I think if you squint really hard, then that's kind of going up a little bit at the end. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah. 
So the other thing I wanted to mention was that we used, we thought of Archiver as a tool for users, but we wanted to improve it based on people's feedback. So we had a survey uh, which had three goals, mainly the question of author names, which I'll talk a little bit more in a sec, but also to kind of figure out what the priorities were to add new features for us, uh, and basically just what people thought of it, like was it a useful thing. This is the distribution around the world, which is pretty much as you expect, mostly Europe, US, and a few Australians. I don't know who was in Darwin. I never figured that out, but someone was in the Northern Territory in Australia. But I think, I mean, all of these were real because we checked all the responses and stuff. Uh, so the idea of author names basically was when we first started, we didn't include author names uh, because we wanted the content to be the priority. So that, you know, sometimes people see papers by certain people and then they're like, oh, I want to read it or I don't want to read it. So we wanted to take out that bias so that your initial judgment would be just what the paper was about. And there are arguments on both sides of this. This was actually when we posted it on Facebook, I think that was like the biggest debate that went on about the author names. So that was unexpected controversy. Uh, but we used the survey to answer that question and figure out how we would move forward. So this was the response. Um, this plot was from an astroinformatics conference. So that's why we were kind of interested in the response based on level. Um, so you could see that a lot of like students, students were kind of divided, but postdocs and professors were much weighed towards the show names. And we decided that we didn't want to like have a question of like not having credit for the papers, so we added the names. Uh, but what we did was we put them under the figures. So you see the figures first and then you see the names, so you can still make the judgment on content first. Uh, the survey helped us figure out what we wanted to develop. So uh, here, the green, which is actually more like murky brown, I don't know. Uh, the green is the things that we've done, the yellow is in progress, and the red has been scrapped because no one really seemed to care that much if we didn't do them. Um, and so we, we had added the comments, the authors specifying the plots can be done. People can favorite post either through WordPress or through Twitter, or there's something called Pocket that we enabled on Archive uh, as well, so you can like Pocket them. Um, but yeah, if, if you have any ideas for new features, please feel free to let me know and we'll add them. Oh, sorry, yep. Uh, if you want, yeah. <laughs> Have you thought about having a, like an archive of specific way to allow paper holders to specify which figures they would like to be? Oh, we do have that. So yeah, not enough people know about it, but all you have to do is put like a comment in your uh, any LaTeX file. It searches all the LaTeX files in a paper, and it has it can be commented out, so it doesn't have to be in the paper. Uh, and if it's in the right format, then Archive will see it and it will pick those figures. So. Uh, like ten so far, <laughs> but yeah. Um, sorry, yet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you go to the archiver page, like in the handy tips box, it says what the format is. But I can show you how to do it later as well. Uh, so 2013, this is what people thought of it. It's an average of 3.84, so I think that was pretty good. Wasn't quite four. Uh, we might do another survey, hopefully, and maybe it'll improve or people have different ideas for how to make it better. Uh, but we were pretty happy. People seem to like Archiver and they seem to still be using it. Uh, in terms of the future, so uh, we've been saying we we're going to move to a server for a long time, but things like Thesis and Aiden moving and things just got in the way, so it's kind of been sidetracked for now. Um, but we are working on that and we actually have a server in place so it's just a matter of getting that happening <coughs> and once we move from wordpress.com to wordpress.org we'll have a lot more flexibility to implement like plugins and things that we can't do while we're hosted on the website the survey helped us figure out what to focus on so i think like if you're developing something like that either a website or a package then getting feedback from people can be useful to prioritize it helped us a lot um, in terms of expansion, we, I mean, one day it would be nice, I guess, to talk to Archive, but we haven't actually heard from them yet. Um, maybe to see if like something more official could happen or even just expanding it to other sciences as well, like chemistry or physics. Uh, Fourier spectral occupancy, so that's measuring the Fourier distribution within an image, uh, is a pretty useful technique for de determining what kind of image you're dealing with and that might be useful to other people beyond Archive. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, and Python can, as well as providing packages for people to do science, you can also use Python as the back end to kind of provide tools and resources for astronomers. So I guess it'd be cool to see more of those kind of things happening and it is possible to do because I have no web, d3.js is a nightmare. <coughs> um, but yeah, so come talk to me if you have any ideas for new features for Archiver, um, if you want to know about any of the packages or how to send things to WordPress or Twitter and things like that. Uh, if, you wanna, if you know about transitioni transitioning, yeah, I can speak, transitioning to WordPress.org, let me know because we're kind of terrified about things going wrong with that. 
Um, and if you're interested in furry spectral occupancy, come see me as well. And check out Archiver. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? about trying to implement some any any of these sort of uh, paper ranking algorithms right just to just help me know which paper I should look at first yeah so that was like I mean people were very early on people kind of asked for like profiles so that based on clicks you could kind of you know it could start to learn um, basically on wordpress.com we can't because like there's so many limitations but once we move to the server and we have wordpress.org going there's a lot of plugins I think to do that so we could be able to get maybe people user accounts and things like that um, and that kind of thing so that's one of the server things <laughs> but yeah Follow up on what Eric just said. Mm -hmm. uh, I played a little while with NLTK, this natural language toolkit yep. that allows you to scrape a PDF, turn it into text, and then I was interested in finding what codes are discussed or presented in papers for AFCR in this case. So okay. that would be a plugin that would be useful for me, but not for everybody. Mm -hmm. How to discover certain things in papers using, for example, NLTK, which is a, a great tool in, in Python. Yeah, so I went down I went down that path because uh, someone was looking at archive and I was like, okay, it's fast, but it's still slow. Uh, and I was like, it would be really cool if you could, you know, come up with a one sentence summary of a paper or something that's really quick. And so I kind of looked into the language processing and it scared me um, because it seemed really hard to, I guess, have a computer judge. Like you can get the frequency of words and things, but going from that into like a sentence or a recommendation seemed difficult, at least for me, but maybe that would be a cool project. Um, so that's what happened. Cloudy Science came out of that because that was still like, it was like an objective way that didn't require like language processing that I wasn't sure how to do, uh, but still showed you what the content of the paper was. So yeah, Cloudy Science, some spin-off of Cloudy Science would maybe work for that. <laughs>